Hello guys and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today I'm back with another interview with Chris Lonsdale. Chris is a psychologist, linguist and educator living in Taiwan right now. And he speaks Mandarin Chinese on a very, very good level. But today we're going to be talking all about English learning and he's going to give you a lot of great tips on how you can learn English in six months. So if you liked today's interview, make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. And now let's begin. Hi, Chris, and welcome to my YouTube channel. How are you doing today? Hi, Veronica. I'm doing very good. Great. Yeah, it's such a pleasure having you on my channel and talking to you about language learning. Because almost a year ago, I watched your interview in Chinese on the Sure Show Chinese YouTube channel, and it gave me a lot of motivation to keep on learning Chinese. And now I'm so excited to talk to you and help my audience learn English in six months. Okay, great. Yeah, so first of all, could you please introduce yourself and tell my audience who you are and what you do? My name is Chris Lonsdale. Um, I sleep, I, I wake up, I eat, I, I, I do work, so <laughs> just just like other people. Um, <clears throat> I um, I came to, to Asia, to, to China, mainland China in 1981. I've been in China and Hong Kong for about 40 years. I run my own consulting business, uh, helping senior leaders and companies um, get their heads straight um, and deal with conflicts and strategic issues in the business. And uh, I'm also the creator of a product called Kung Fu English, which is uh, an iOS based device for Chinese people, Mandarin speakers to learn English. Um, so it's, it's, it's a language in your pocket. So that's sort of a, a quick summary of, of what I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. And how did you decide to start learning Chinese? Okay, um, it happened when I got off the train in Beijing in 1981. I was 21 years old, uh, and it went from there. I, I, I didn't go to learn a language. I, go to, uh, I went to, to be in the culture. Um, and to to explore the world and learning a language was was simply a part of that to get a, into a different perspective of, of things in life so so that was why I went and, and language just naturally was part of that and back then there were probably like very few resources to learn Chinese right oh there were about 1.3 billion of them in China language is a tool of communication and if you treat it that way then the world is full of opportunities yeah yeah then the world is your oyster right <laughs> The world is your oyster, exactly. You know, I, I, I learned something really interesting. The Chinese don't understand each other. So I would take train trips around China and they'd be talking to each other and they, they had different accents and they wouldn't understand. So they would hold up their hands and they would draw characters with their finger on their hand to explain what they mean. So it, it's a country united by a common script more than a common tongue. I have some friends from... Fuzhou and they speak in this dialect instead of like Mandarin Chinese. Obviously, they understand Mandarin Chinese, but still they prefer like among themselves with their friends and family, they prefer to use this dialect. And I don't understand it at all. No, no, no. Well, the, the, the Fujian dialect is, is really quite different. You've, you've got Cantonese, you then have, have, have Chaozhou, which is eastern Guangdong province, which is very different. Again, you have the Hakka which is the Kerja, the, which is the guest people who have their own dialect and they sort of are inhabited all over southern China in pockets. You have Fujian, you, you have Sichuan dialect, which is, is very strong and very different. Um, so there's, there's quite a few really big differences in, in China. Mandarin, of course. You have a really, really famous TED Talk. Your TEDx Talks video has over 27 million views nowadays. There you say that everyone can learn a foreign language in six months. How? How is it possible? How is it possible? Okay. Well, you have to spend more than five minutes a day. The, the reason for that title was the experience that we had. Um, I wrote a book called The Third Year, one, two, three years. Um, you can learn any language. And many people from different countries took that book, read it, and then they used it to go in country and learn a language in country. So uh, an Indian girl went, went to Chile um, and she was fluent in six months. An Australian guy went to China, he was fluent in Mandarin in six months. Um, a, a girl from Australia went to, to Brazil, um, she was fluent in six months and fluent to the level that they could get hired 
in companies requiring bilingual skills to be a sales manager or <clears throat> manager of diversity or, or something else. So these were senior roles. These were not not sort of bottom of the of the heap. So so what was coming back very clearly was when people were using the the ideas that I talk about, then if you're going to if you use the language, then you're going to be competent to fluent in six months, basically. It seems to be the, seems to be the timeline. Some people can do it much faster um, because maybe they already have another couple of languages that they've learned. Um, people who are monolingual will be a little bit slower because they have some issues in how they think about language which get in the way. They think that, that the sounds for things are the things and, and it's really hard to break that. Since you speak English, I assume you, also, you speak Russian as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Russian is my native language. So, and your, your English accent is very, very American and, and very clear. So you would understand that they're just labels for things. Words are labels for things, but monolingual people don't get that. Mo monolingual people think that the sound is the thing, and and to break that in their mind is is a little bit tough. So it can be a little bit slower for them to start with. Uh, but it, but in general, it was six months. If you're using it to communicate, treating it as a tool, if it's relevant to you, then yeah, that's that's a sort of fairly average sort of time frame. So yeah, with the help of this book, people can, I guess, learn some principles, right, that they can use to learn a language in six months. Exactly. And and then the TEDx talk, after many years of experience and, and seeing people using our product, it was very clear what some of the, the core messages had to be for people to understand. So, <clears throat> you know, it's got to be relevant to you. If it's not relevant to you, you're not going to do anything about it. You have to treat it as a tool. You have to understand that it's a physiological process. You're not sort of learning concepts. You're actually learning to use your body. You're learning to use your face, your mouth, your ears. It's very interesting because uh, when I watch anything in English, like YouTube videos or especially with TV shows and different actors, especially those that I really like, I try to mimic their pronunciation you know sometimes not throughout the whole show obviously and i feel like it helps me improve my accent a lot and like what do you think about this approach um absolutely that's what you need to do that's what babies do when they're learning their mother tongue if you try and and do do a language by keeping your old accent <laughs> It's, it's not going to work. So you know, a, a great story was um, in Africa, this English person spoke to a black person, but she spoke in Swahili using an English accent. And the, the African guy goes, I have no idea what she's saying. You've got to get into the physiology of, of the language. So for instance, if I start speaking to you now in a little bit of Scots accent, you'll discover that, that my facial expressions and everything else have changed. It's not the same as I'm talking about that with my other accent, right? So it's a, it's, it's a whole body phenomenon. Um, and when you understand that and you actually decide to be like a child and play with it, then, then it becomes a lot of fun and you get the out outcomes you're looking for. Is it the only way that people can, like, is it the only approach people can use to improve their accent or are there any other good ways? One of the things is you just have to listen a lot. So, so for instance, did you practice your American accent? Yeah, I mean, sometimes a little bit, yeah. But mostly I listened a lot. That was the main thing I did. Exactly. So when you're listening, your brain is actually picking it up unconsciously. And then you start to to use those sounds. And you, you even notice when you're speaking, eh, it's not quite right. So you make a change. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I did sometimes. Yeah, I would. I always listen to podcasts. That's my favorite thing to do. And every time I hear something interesting, like maybe how they're connecting words together, I would sometimes repeat it because I would think, wow, that's fascinating. I should, I should try to, again, copy them, right? Mimic them, their pronunciation. Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, when, I, when I was a kid at school, I, I was terrible with accents. I had a friend who would mimic teachers and cartoon characters on TV and he was absolutely brilliant and I was extremely jealous of him. Um, <clears throat> but then um, there was this Scottish comedian by the name of Billy Colley and um, he and I used to both listen to him, very, very, very funny. I realized the only way to tell those jokes was to do it with a Scottish accent because if you tried to do it with an English accent, it was like really weird. So, <laughs> so I, I literally practiced that to, to just mimic that accent. Um, 
And uh, the result of that was I was in, in Beijing and I met a group of um, people from Scotland and I was chatting with them. And I tried for two hours to convince them I was not from Scotland and had never been to Scotland in my life. But I did that using the Scottish accent, right? And they would not believe me. It was so funny. I think yesterday I was listening to an episode and the guy there, he is from upstate New York, but his whole childhood he watched British TV. And he has like the best British accent there is. And like every single time he meets a new person, obviously he can speak with an American accent too, but he always try to use his British accent to just, you know, make fun of them. He's like, guess where I'm from? All of them are like, English? He's like, no, I'm from New York. Well, the, the funniest, funniest thing with, 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 with the YouTube video, um, very early on, people were coming on and arguing about where my accent was from. And some were saying I was Irish, some were saying I was I was was American, right? There was a whole bunch of people with opinions. So I came in, I said, actually, here is the origin of my accent. Being in Hong Kong, you need to sort of roll your R's a little bit so people can hear them. You need to slow down a little bit. There's a bunch of things you do so non-native English speakers can understand. You've also got a lot of Americans, a lot of Canadians, uh, some Brits there. So it's it's like a hodgepodge of different accents from different places. Yeah, yeah. And even sometimes when, again, I watch like a British TV show, I never practiced a British accent before. And I try to speak with an American accent like always exclusively but sometimes I just realized that I do pick up certain patterns of the British accent and yeah sometimes it's just a little bit confusing to me especially after I watch too much of British TV and I also wanted to talk to you about like this concept of having a talent towards foreign languages because a lot of people even like when I was a child it's very common in Russia for people to think that you have a talent for certain things but I really like your opinion like again in your TED talk you said that like talent it doesn't matter and like immersion you also uh, talked about immersion in a country, they're not important when we're trying to learn a language. Why? Why are they not important? How do we put this? It's not that talent's not important, it's that everyone born has a talent for learning a language. Just for, for learning, for, for anything really, I think. It's just persistence, right? Well, it's persistence, but it's also, um, as babies, we go through, we learn a language by ourselves with no one teaching us. By the time we get to school and they start teaching us, we actually already know the language, right? That's that's sort of the the bottom line. Um, so so it, it's not so much about this person has this talent and this person doesn't have this talent. It's we, you know, if if a person didn't have a talent for language learning, they would not be speaking their mother tongue. Now there are some people who speak a mother tongue really well, and some people who don't speak it so well. That will sort of define how well they speak a foreign language. You know, how good you are at your mother tongue sort of gives you the, the bounds of what you can do in a foreign language. But I think it's also like human psychology. If we fail, we don't want to, a lot of people don't want to um, say that it's their fault. You know, they want to say, oh, I just don't have a talent. You know, you have the talent for foreign languages, but I don't. Yeah, they just don't want to admit that they don't, I don't know, study hard enough. They haven't even failed. They don't try because they feel that because they feel they might fail. The way to deal with that is say you make a sound wrong, what's the worst that can happen? Is 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 the is planet Earth going to explode? That's actually a very good question to ask yourself. And sometimes every single time that I have to do something a little bit uncomfortable for me, I always ask myself this question, like, what is the worst that's going to happen if I do that? Yeah, I might just feel a little bit uncomfortable talking to this person or asking this question, but that's it. That's the worst that's going to happen. Exactly. And, you know, a few times of that and you discover that nothing bad happens, so you're going to be fine. And what about the immersion uh, in a country where the language you want to learn is spoken? So many people nowadays, unfortunately, like we can travel that freely right now. It's overrated and misunderstood. OK, so you will see adults going to another country and immersing and they are dealing with other adults who are speaking adult to adult, and they can't find a way in, right? So you'll see people who have moved overseas, they've lived there for 20 years, they still don't speak the language. That is very, very common, okay? Um, so this idea of immersion, you have to actually take it a lot deeper. You need to find people that you can talk with, right? So for you, you're listening to podcasts, right? Um, some people might watch 
football. Uh, it could be anything. You meet you meet a, a friend who doesn't speak your language. You you decide to learn theirs. You have these really simple interactions. It grows over time, right? So it's it's not immersion in the culture per se. It is immersion in the task of communicating that is meaningful and relevant for you. I completely agree with you, especially with the part that it's like meaningful and relevant to you, because you will always come back to that if it's important to you. Exactly, exactly. It has to be meaningful, it has to be relevant. If it's not, you're wasting your time. And when I was watching your TED talk, you say you said that people should find like a language pairing for themselves. But you also said that like uh, a spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend is not a good language pairing. I just wanted to ask you why. Why are they not yeah good at being a language parent? Okay, all right. The, the, with a spouse or or a boyfriend or a girlfriend, the relate the relationship is going to be in one language, right? And so if you want to learn the other person's language, it means that you become a baby and they're still an adult. So it, it changes the power distance between the two people, right? And that can be quite disruptive in the relationship. So that's why I say a, a spouse is not particularly good. Um, a language parent is somebody who understands what you're meaning, even if you're way off in your pronunciation, the the choice of words, the degree of complexity that you're using. Yeah, now now I understand why you call this person language pair, because this dynamic is like a parent and a child, right? Yeah, so my next question is about um, being perfect in a foreign language. And I had this problem for a long time, too. I was struggling. I mean, it's also like more like of a personal problem, just being perfect in general. So many people want to become like fluent, advanced, perfect for them in a foreign language. And what advice would you give to those people who have anxiety of not being perfect in a foreign language? Okay, so explain to me how you can be perfect using a screwdriver. I mean, using it how it's supposed to be used. Well, how about being perfect at driving? Yeah, that's more complicated. Right. So so what is perfect? Have you listened to people speaking Russian? And how often do they stop midway, stutter, change the words, go back, use the wrong word, get lost in their head? So, so the question is, why do people give themselves a, a target for a foreign language, which is higher than the target they've accepted for their mother tongue? There's so much leeway when we're speaking our native language, right? We just don't really care. We're like, it's my native language. It's my mother tongue. I know everything so I can make as many mistakes as I want. Exactly. Exactly. And and it's not even mistakes. It's just sometimes your, your thinking is not keeping up with your mouth. Sometimes you really, because what you're doing when you're speaking a language is you're going internal. You're trying to find the internal representations of what you're talking about, then find the words to, to match it. And sometimes you can't quite find a word that really does the job for what you're trying to do. So there's all of these dynamics going on. You might get a little drunk. Your tongue is not operating the way that it normally operates. I mean, there's so many variables in terms of, of speaking a language that this idea of perfection is just um, it's an irritant and a barrier to actually becoming good at language. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, there is no such thing as being perfect. Yeah, that's what everyone has to realize. And but you you can be, you can be a six month old English baby and speaking at a one year level, right? So or you can be a six month old English baby and speaking at a five month level and growing up in your mother tongue. Same thing, you know. Some kids are like nya, 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 at one year old. Some are like silent until they're two. Improvement should always be gauged against where am I now and. Have I gone beyond that? Can, what do I want to do next that's better than where I am? Not having this idealized thing called perfection and being a million miles away from it because that is soul destroying and not helpful. Yeah. <laughs> There's always room for improvement. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Thank you so much for all your wonderful ideas and advice. I think my audience is really going to appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, so I think we can finish for now. And before we wrap up, um, you can just tell my audience where they can find you, like maybe your website, your app, right? So the, the easiest place to find me, it's all in Chinese, of course, but um, it's www.kungfuenglish.com. That's K-U-N-G-F-U, 
E-N-T-L-I-S-H dot com. Um, that's probably the, the easiest place to find me. Yeah, so thank you. And uh, maybe we'll talk to you again later. Yeah, well, I'd love to hear how your, your audience does with the ideas and, you know, see, see some of the um, exciting experiences that they may have by applying these ideas in real life. Guys, this interview was so much fun for me to film because Chris shared so many great tips on how you can learn English as fast as possible and how you shouldn't be worried or anxious about language learning at all. I really hope you liked this interview and you'll use all of these tips to study English yourself. If you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. You can also follow me on Instagram because there I share my everyday life with you. If you want to get a script to this video, make sure to join me here on YouTube by clicking this join button or you can also go on my Patreon page and pick a membership there. So thank you guys for watching this video. See you next time. Bye!